Hi, thanks so much for coming to this session as part of the Linden Wood Certificate in Culturally Responsive um, Assessment and Pedagogy. My name is Karen Singer Freeman, and the session that I'll be giving today is considering ways to increase equity through the use of self reflective writing. Um, just a little bit about myself. I spent 20 years as a faculty member at the University, uh, State University of New York Purchase College, where I was a member of the psychology faculty prior to coming to the Office of Assessment and Accreditation at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And I'll be talking to you about some research from my previous institution, as well as some work we're now doing at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. So what I plan to do for this session is we're going to start off talking a little bit about the theory of change. So why is it that I believe self-reflective writing will increase equity? Um, so I'll begin with some barriers to equity, then I'll talk a little bit about what is self-reflective writing um, and how it can be used in conjunction with e-portfolios and brief psychological interventions. Um, then I'll share with you some of my own research findings. We'll move on to some applications, so ways that you could create self-reflective assignments yourself, and then I'll provide you with some more information in case you want to learn more. So I've been doing a fair amount of work over the last two years with my colleagues in the Office of Assessment and Accreditation in considering ways that assessments can be barriers to equity in higher education and ways that changes to assessments can increase equity in higher education. Um, and you know, the first thing that I, I hope we all believe is that assessments are really important. And they're not just important for accreditation purposes, they're really important to students. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. Firstly, students focus much more tightly on what we assess than any other part of our class. So even the very best students who are the most engaged in our classes are really concerned about their grades. And so when something is in a graded assignment, that information is more likely to be remembered and students view that information as the most important aspects of the course. Um, so when we think about what we're assessing, we need to really think about what is it that we want students to retain, because that attention to the material is going to increase retention. But we also have to be aware that what we assess actually communicates evaluative information to students. And what I mean by that is if we don't choose to assess a, some material, students view that material as being less important to us or less valuable. Um, and so, for example, you know, if we make efforts to include diverse authors in a class, but we don't assess the material that as much from um, authors who come from um, underserved groups as we do the white authors, the white male authors, then the fact that we're not um, including those in our assessments is, is noted by the students and is communicating evaluative information to them. Um, <clears throat> assessments also matter because even if an assessment doesn't lead to a student getting a poor final grade, when students do poorly on academic tasks they've been assigned and that are graded, it contributes to their developing sense of academic self-efficacy. So academic self-efficacy describes um, a student's beliefs that they're able to accomplish academic tasks when they set their mind to it. And when students have weak academic self-efficacy, so when they're not confident that they can succeed at difficult academic tasks, this can have implications for their retention in a major as well as their retention in an institution and how hard they try when they um, don't initially succeed at a task. So, you know, sometimes I'll speak with faculty and they'll say, oh, well, even though there was a big equity gap on those quizzes, they, they're a very small part of the student's final grade. And I would argue that even when an assignment doesn't contribute substantially to a student's grade, if the assignment is evoking inequity, and that by that I mean a grade distribution 
were students from historically underserved groups, whether that be underrepresented ethnic minority students, transfer students, women, first generation students, low income students, students with disability, any of those groups. If they're getting significantly lower grades than the more privileged students in the class, then that's, that's important and it's something we need to address. Um, and then, you know, more obviously, assessments and grades impact students' progress towards their major, whether they can move on to a prerequisite, from a prerequisite to a, a later class, um, their progress towards degrees, and then after graduation, the jobs and graduate programs they get into. So hopefully I've convinced you that assessments matter. Um, I believe that some assessments are more likely to be biased than others. Um, I've done another session on um, equity in assessments with my colleagues Christine Robinson and Harriet Hobbs that's part of this um, series so you can watch that if you want to learn more about this um, but there's you know a fair amount of evidence that multiple choice testing is problematic and doesn't measure learning equally across all groups of students there's also mounting evidence of implicit bias in grading um, and Finally, there's, um, I'm concerned that when assessment measures are poorly aligned with what's been taught in a class, that these sorts of assignments also might evoke equity gaps in places where students' actual comprehension is equivalent. So um, with my colleagues, Harriet Hobbs and Christine Robinson, we've been developing a theory of what it takes for an assignment to be culturally relevant. And we say culturally relevant rather than culturally responsive, if you've heard about culturally responsive pedagogy, because students can't talk to assignments and assignments can't respond to students. So when we're talking about pedagogy, we can be responsive because we're in the classroom and we can change um, based on student questions or student feedback. When we're devising assignments, we can change from one year or one semester to the next. But I think the goal here is to create culturally relevant assignments, meaning that the assignments are designed to maximize the ability of all students to demonstrate accurately their concept mastery. Um, and there's really three features to having culturally relevant assignments or assessments. The first is that the environment in which we do the assessment should be inclusive. Um, so we know that if anything highlights a student's awareness of their membership in a group, that has negative stereotypes attached to it around performance on a task, then that will interfere with their ability to fully show their mastery. So for example, I'm a female. If you highlight to me my female status before giving me a math exam, I might do less well on that math exam because there'll be interference from my thoughts about the fact that there's stereotypes about females not being good at math. So when we want to create an inclusive environment, we want to do whatever we can to minimize students' feelings that um, we are aware of their group membership. And alternatively, we want to maximize something that Randy Bass came up with quite a few years ago now and termed social pedagogy. And social pedagogy describes sort of the opposite of stereotype threat um, in that social pedagogy is when we engage students in an authentic task um, that holds value to them and, um, and, the, and is communication intensive. So when students are, and you know, this is simply put, if you ask students to talk to you and to other students and to family members about something that matters to them or to write convincingly about it, that's going to have high social pedagogy and that's going to maximize um, all students' ability to really demonstrate their full level of mastery. Um, these next two things are part of a, a matrix of culturally responsive or relevant pedagogy that I came up with with um, Harriet Hobbs and Christine Robinson. 
And the first is that content should be inclusive. Now, inclusive content has been around for a while, um, and oftentimes we think about, you know, making sure that the authors in our literature class represent the ethnic diversity of the United States or your university. Um, we've expanded the concept of inclusive content to be that it should be, all the content should be equally familiar and accessible to all students. So, for example, um, open resource, educational resources will be more accessible because you don't have to buy an expensive textbook. Um, having clear instructions with explicit grading criteria makes the content and the assignment more accessible because students don't have to rely on previous experience with a similar assignment or going and asking the faculty member questions. Um, in, content is more inclusive when it's aligned with teaching because we're not asking students to demonstrate skills that we haven't taught them. Um, so we're not having students rely on prior preparation. Instead, we're creating assignments in which um, everything they need to know was provided to them in the class. Um, and then in scaffolded assignments, this is where we ask students to build their skills gradually so they can all benefit from feedback from the instructor as they um, get to more difficult types, ways of demonstrating knowledge. Um, and then the second feature that we've become really interested in was proposed by Jacqueline Eccles quite a while ago. Um, and it's this idea of utility value. And simply put, utility value describes um, a student's belief about the worth of an assignment beyond getting the grade. Right? So an assignment can have academic utility value if the student feels that doing this assignment is going to help them succeed in a future class because they're getting a good academic skill. It can have professional utility value if a student feels that doing the assignment will help them prepare for a career they would like to pursue. And it can have personal utility value if the student feels that completing the assignment will help them learn about themselves or is interesting or anything like that. So it's my belief that self-reflective assignments meet all of the um, descriptions of, of what is required for an assignment to be culturally relevant. Um, and so before I get into a little more of the why, let me just give you a little bit of a what. So I define self-reflective assessments or assignments as structured assignments in which students evaluate a body of work or concepts reflect on their own personal learning, and consider how the work is personally relevant. And this definition is important because, um, you know, at this point I've worked with biology faculty, um, you know, English faculty, psychology faculty, faculty from all across the board to come up with ways to take topical assignments and make them self-reflective. Um, and so, you know, you, you need to really be thinking broadly about self-reflective assignments for that to work. So generally in these assignments, we ask students to describe either a content area that they learned in a class, or it can be their process as learners in something like a lab class. Then we ask them to evaluate how that learning influences their understanding of something in the world, themselves, another concept. Um, then we ask them to integrate the learning and connect it to their lives. And finally, we ask them to look ahead to make plans for the future. And that could be a future class, or that could be your future life, um, or it could be prioritizing what is most important for you to remember. Along with self-reflective assignments, it's really important that you have a clearly articulated rubric. Um, and ideally, if you're going to be using self-reflective writing assignments in a course, I encourage you to basically have the same um, things that you're looking for across all the rubrics in the class and then just tailor them to a specific assignment. Um, so when you have similar learning outcomes across a class, it's going to help students see where they went astray on an early assignment and then do better in the future assignments. And it also um, gets their attention because they'll notice, they'll be more likely to pay attention if they missed something on an early assignment when they know that the same sort of skill is going to be um, checked in later assignments. So um, 
In one example that I'll be talking about later today in the child development class, I had a total of eight or 10 self-reflective writing assignments. And across all of them, I had um, rubrics in which there were two um, places where they got points based on conceptual mastery, one based on conceptual integration, and then two for application. And you can see an example here of one of those rubrics. Um, when you're using the rubric, it's really critical that you use culturally responsive feedback. Um, and so Gloria Ladson Billings was the first person to talk about this. But when you know, you don't want to just grade easy, right? You want it's your job as a, a faculty member to help students improve. Um, but when you tell a student that they've done something wrong, it's critical to um, express confidence in students ability to show future mastery and direct them in that way. Um, and, you know, when I've used these writing assignments in large classes, I've had undergraduate teaching assistants who've helped me and teaching them how to provide that kind of feedback takes monitoring, um, but it's also, I think, a really great skill to give your teaching assistants. Um, so in addition to encouraging performance approach behaviors in students by giving them similar rubrics across reflective writing assignments, um, these rubrics also reduce implicit bias in grading because they help the faculty or the teaching assistant really um, focus on grading only what you've said you're going to grade and not other things. Um, and so in that way, the use of rubrics has been shown to increase equity broadly, whether or not you're using self-reflective writing. So why is it that I think um, self-reflective writing is culturally relevant? So firstly, um, I believe self-reflective writing is one of the best ways to really have an assignment be inclusive, especially if you are able to ask the student to describe something in their own lived experience and relate the content to that lived experience. Um, so, you know, I say here inviting material from students' heritage groups. One of the things that I think a lot of faculty struggle with when we're trying to make our classes culturally inclusive is it's hard to even know what diversity is present in your class. Um, and the, the nature of our classes is changing on a daily basis. And so, you know, we must try and have sources that are from diverse thinkers and writers and have diverse perspectives. Um, but I felt when I was a faculty member that I would never really be able to capture the diversity of experiences and perspectives in a class when it was 80 or 100 students. When you ask a student to describe their own lived experience in their assignment, um, the diversity is there, right? They're, they're providing that material. Um, and really importantly, I'm reading that material, or if I have teaching assistant help, I would have them synthesize and summarize some of that material for me. Um, and that would provide me with examples that I could use in that class to share out and in future classes so that I would become more aware of what the lived experiences of my students were. Um, it's also inclusive because the grading is really clearly guided by the rubrics and the students have a really clear sense of what's expected of them because the rubrics provide that. Um, and it's really important, by the way, to give the rubric along with the assignment. And before the early assignments are due, I would even put the rubric up um, during a lecture and say, look, this is what I'm looking for in here um, so that students um, maximally benefit from having those really detailed set of expectations of what you're looking for. These assignments are also high in utility value because students like to think about how things relate to their lives. You know, developmentally, adolescents are really fascinated by themselves. And um, so relating course material to their lives and their communities is something that they value. Um, and as they share their lived experience with the faculty member who shares it with the class, 
that increases their sense of utility value for it because it gives them a sense that even in a large class of maybe 100 students, they're actually seen and heard, right? And their experience is being represented. And then finally, and I'm gonna talk more about this in, in the following slides, um, these assignments document learning in a way that's interesting and relevant to students and anything you can do to um, make that documentation more powerful, I think increases the impact of these assignments. So I said that self-reflective writing works best when we can boost the utility value, um, so how useful students feel it will be by um, putting it in a package that is going to hold value. And I've done a fair amount of work with ePortfolios. At the end of this talk, there's some references to some of the papers that I've done on the value of ePortfolios. But ePortfolios are basically where you ask students to curate a set of their work um, and write about reflecting on what that work shows about their mastery. Um, and I've done a lot of great work with ePortfolios that have, has incorporated self-reflective writing. Um, the thing that I'll show you today is I, you know, I'm a true believer in ePortfolios and I'd love to talk to anybody who wants to talk about, you know, how you create a good ePortfolio curriculum. Um, but self-reflective writing in, in a lot of ways has many of the same benefits as ePortfolios. So if you can create an ePortfolio, especially one like you can see here that came from a student in a summer research program I ran, um, 
that is full of images of the students that they share with other students and has the self-reflective writing, that's going to really create a rich social pedagogy that's going to potentially boost the value of self-reflective writing. But even if you can't, self-reflective writing still has a lot of value all on its own. Now, the last thing I want to tell you about um, before I get into some research findings and then how you do this is brief psychological um, interventions. So brief psychological interventions have been around for 10, 15 years now. Um, there's a nice review article by Walton if you um, want to learn more about them. But they're essentially, um, well, they're, they're short experiences that seem to change the way students think about a critical moment in their lives and therefore lead to um, improved success. And as I go through three of them, you'll see that pretty much all of them in, involve self-reflective writing or a self-reflective video um, or self-reflective conversation. So sense of belonging interventions um, usually target first year students. And what they do is they engage students in considering the fact that everybody initially when they get to college feels that they don't belong, but that that feeling is fleeting. And so, you know, sometimes they'll have um, more advanced students come and talk to the students or have recorded videos where they say, yeah, my first semester, I really felt like I didn't belong, but it passed. Um, and then pretty much all the interventions end with students either preparing a video or writing something about what they learned and what they want future students to know. And so that's a self-reflective writing piece in it. And there's a nice body of research that shows that um, underserved students, so first generation students, underrepresented ethnic minority students um, who experience a sense of belonging intervention are more likely to stay at a university and also have improved grades. Values affirmation has been done in high school as well as college. And that's basically where you ask students to reflect on what are their own personal values for a period of time. Um, and so again, self-reflective writing there, and that's been associated with improved grades, again, for students who um, generally are underserved, different groups of students. And then mindset, I already mentioned um, a little earlier, but that came from the work of Carol Dweck, and it's where you um, talk to students about whether they view intelligence as fixed, something that doesn't change, or like a muscle, something that grows with effort and over time. And when students um, embrace a growth mindset, they show increased persistence and improved grades. And also, um, it's been associated with this idea of grit, which is seen as a personality variable, but basically how, how much you will persist in working hard at something difficult to achieve a long-range goal. Um, and in my self-reflective writing assignments that I'm going to talk to you about, we had an assignment on the growth mindset, which you can see in that top picture. That's actually a YouTube or a TED talk by Angela Duckworth, who, um, oh, that was, I'm sorry, that's the grit intervention. And we also did a growth mindset. Um, the bottom picture is Eduardo Briciano, who is giving a TED Talk on growth mindset, and I'll be talking about results from some of them in a minute. So I've given you the theory. Now I'm going to quickly go through a little bit of research, um, and I'm going to be telling you about self-reflective writing that took place in a summer research program that was six weeks long at Purchase College State University of New York. The students were involved in STEM research, um, so science, bench science research for 40 hours a week. And I did supplemental activities, which included self-reflective writing with them, as well as advising. Um, the program over different summers had anywhere between 18 and 60 community college students. It was held at the four-year school. And the students were all either underrepresented ethnic minority, low income, um, with a serious disability or first generation college students. Um, the second set of data I'm going to tell you about comes from my child development class, which is a 15 week class. I've already 
talk to you about some of those assignments. The class has held anywhere from 50 to 100 bachelor's degree seeking students and generally it's just under 50 percent of students who are underrepresented ethnic minority um, or first generation. And then finally I'm going to talk to you about some hot off the press data with a collaborator of mine um, who works at a two-year college that is um, majority Hispanic. So I think it's about 80% of the students there are Hispanic and another 5 or 10% African American. Um, and she's done some really interesting work in her introductory psychology class, which is also a general education class. So first we're going to be, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so in each of these settings, we did a redesign to incorporate self-reflective writing. So in the summer research program, we added e-portfolios with um, self-reflective writing. So students did weekly journaling and weekly responses to a self-reflective writing prompt. Um, and a bunch of those included the brief psychological interventions that I told you about previously. Um, and, you know, the work was required, but it happened after their normal work day um, and was not graded. In the four-year child development class, I've taught the class with e-portfolios as well as the same assignments, but as papers that were done through Turnitin, and I'll be showing you differences between those. Um, and the brief psychological interventions were either done in those self-reflective writing assignments, um, or also there were peer-led um, discussion sessions where some of them took place. And then finally, we'll be talking about the two-year class. Oh, and in the child development class, there were still some tests, but the class was redesigned so that I think it was 85% of the students' final grades came from the writing, um, and a very small remaining percentage came from tests, whereas previously it had been flipped so that almost all their grade was determined by multiple choice tests. Um, and then in the, the two-year um, college class intro psych, the faculty member revised the class so that in addition to multiple choice tests, she included a time capsule where students had to collect things throughout the whole class that explained how the class material related to the students' lives, including pictures, and create a time capsule which they wouldn't look at for 10 years. Um, so really high in utility value and inclusive content, I think. And then she designed these real world tests in which instead of just straight out multiple choice questions, students were asked to, um, they were given a problem and they were asked to use all the course material to figure out how to um, propose an answer to that real world problem. In all three of these settings, there were enhanced social pedagogy, so students were encouraged to talk to each other and talk to family members um, by imagining them, their future self or family as an authentic audience. Um, in all three settings, the professor provided supported comments in response to students' work um, and shared themes with the whole class, which is another way of in enhancing the social pedagogy and convincing students that the work has value um, and creating that sense of community. Um, and then the use of e-portfolios and time capsule were a really strong way of boosting the sense of an authentic audience. When I did the, the work with the students as papers instead of e-portfolio, I told the students that I would curate all of their papers into an attractive document at the end of the semester and give it back to them. So that was how I sort of tried to boost some of the social pedagogy there. And in all settings, we encouraged the students to save and share their work um, and said, you know, this is likely going to be something you'll really enjoy looking back on in 10 years. So the first work I'm going to tell you about is comparing exactly the same assignments um, between the summer research program and the child development class. So what you can see that dark picture is an e-portfolio from the summer research program. Um, and then the top box is a Turnitin assignment paper. 
where students did the same assignment that they were asked to do in the summer research program, but as a formal paper. And then the bottom box on the right is showing you an ePortfolio assignment of the same version. And so the, the point of comparing these is they're all self-reflective writing, but it'll give you a little bit of a, a peek into, you know, how the way you package these assignments can actually influence how students behave. Um, and so this just shows you the sample. You'll see that um, URM stands for underrepresented ethnic minority students. And so in the summer program, it was 90% underrepresented ethnic minority students, whereas in the class, it was more like 50%. But besides that, um, the, the groups seem pretty comparable. Okay, so the first thing I want you to see is students write a lot. Um, you know, young students, right? These are all introductory classes or community college students in a summer program where they're not getting a grade. And what you can see in this graph is the number of words students generated in response to the conceptual questions, the reflection questions, which I think I had called application on a previous slide, and those planning questions. And the first bar in turquoise is the ungraded ePortfolios, so that's the summer research program. The navy bar is the graded ePortfolios, so that's the child development class when we used ePortfolios. And then the turquoise, no, I, yeah, turquoise, I guess, bar is the graded papers. Um, and so if you look, the first thing to notice is the students spent the most time writing about the reflective part. And so that's where they're taking the content and they're using it to understand their own lives. And so what I take from that is that students really like that part, right? They didn't have to write that much, but they chose to write that much. Um, the second thing that I want you to notice is if you look at the third bar, that turquoise bar, that the one place where students wrote more in the formal papers was describing the concepts. Um, and I think that's kind of interesting because I think the format of the assignment, when it was a formal paper, students felt like they needed to spend more time, um, you know, clearly describing the concepts. But despite that, what I want you to notice is the grades on the assignments weren't different, right? So there were equal um, percentages of complete assignments in papers and ePortfolios, even though students spent more time talking about the concepts in ePortfolios. So I started off by saying, you know, ePortfolios add something. And one thing that was really interesting is when we looked at the ePortfolios, whether they were graded or not graded, so the first two bars are the ePortfolios, we saw more um, articulation of the impact of the self-reflective writing in that format. So this is a little hard to get through, but this was the mindset assignment where we ask students um, to describe the research on mindsets and you know how it helps kids and then reflect on their own mindset and then um, think about what they wanted to remember about a mindset going forward. Um, and what this graph is showing is on the left hand side, it's a percentage of students who said they had a growth mindset. And on the right hand side, it's the percentage of students who said something about wanting to be gritty in the future. So wanting to persist in the face of difficulty in the future. Um, and so what you can see is that the portfolios had more students saying that they had a growth mindset than the formal paper and also more students who took it one step further, right? We hadn't talked about grit at all at that point, but students who said, yeah, you know, in the future, I'm gonna persist. Um, and so, you know, if you're thinking about maybe trying to use brief psychological interventions in a class, then it seems like the ePortfolios might be a slightly more powerful way to do that. Um, and this is some further evidence of how engaging in self-reflective writing can actually encourage students to engage in personal change. So 68 students didn't write about grit and 33 students did write about grit. And now this is only in the classroom in those graded assignments. And we had students complete Duckworth's grit measure at the beginning of class and the end of class. 
And so on the left-hand side, you can see that grit scores didn't change for students who didn't write about grit in their assignment. But on the right-hand side, where you can see the green bar is pre-test of 3.28, and then the blue bar is post-test of 3.55, for the students who wrote about grit in their growth mindset assignment, so who said, I'm going to persist in the future, they actually had a significant increase in their response to the grit scale at the end of class, which was about a month after they did that assignment. Um, so, you know, grit isn't really supposed to change. It's supposed to sort of be a, a personality feature, but we found that result very intriguing. Um, and then so finally, and that's really the topic of today's session, self-reflective writing appears to increase equity. And I'm going to show you one example here. Um, some of the references have other examples if you are interested. Um, but what you can see here are the ePortfolios, papers, and quizzes were now just within the child development class for underrepresented ethnic minority students who are in the turquoise bar and non-underrepresented ethnic minority students who are represented with the blue bar. And there was no equity gap, so grades were equivalent in the ePortfolio assignments or the papers, right? Either one. So the self-reflective writing assignments, students did equally well at showing their knowledge regardless of their ethnicity. But in the quizzes, which were open book and open note, there was a significant um, difference so that Underrepresented ethnic minority students received on average 77% and non-underrepresented ethnic minority students got 85%. And so, you know, I think this is pretty powerful because open book, open note, pretty easy quizzes. The quizzes were not designed to be hard. There's that equity gap. It didn't shift their grade, but, you know, as I said at the beginning, perhaps it has some impact on their sense of academic self-efficacy. And these writing assignments, which I think are a much better measurement of deep learning, didn't have an equity gap. Students also really like self-reflective writing assignments. So I had students complete a survey at the end of the class, and over 75% of students reported that the assignments encouraged reflection, enhanced their learning, provided an accurate assessment of their learning, and should be used in future classes. And, you know, oftentimes faculty say students don't like to write, um, and I've certainly experienced that, but students like this kind of writing. Um, a lot of students in their course evaluations mentioned personal change, too. So they said things like, I'm gritty, or I can't do this yet. Um, as some of the things they felt were the most important things they learned in the class. So reflective writing also works in tests. Um, you know, so far I've been giving you these sort of longish writing assignments that are, you know, maybe a little hard to manage in a big class. But I want to conclude with the data that came from this community college introductory psychology class. And what we did in this class is sort of the next wave of my work. Um, I've developed a measure of inclusive content and utility value, which is described in more detail in the other talk that I'm giving in this series. Um, but basically, there's five or six items that the students are asked about different measures. So, you know, to what extent do you feel that um, the material was stuff that you've been exposed to. To what extent do you feel this is something you talk about with friends? Questions like that. And they would respond on a four-point Likert scale. And so what you can see here are their average ratings across the inclusive content measure and the utility value measure. So the inclusive content responses are on the left and the utility value responses are on the right. And then this was when they were evaluating multiple choice exams the real world exams, which were where they had to use the class materials to try and explain or solve a real world problem, and the time capsule, which was where they had to gather materials from the class that were personally relevant and put them in a time capsule to look at in 10 years. And what you can see is that the multiple choice classes were significantly lower, I'm sorry, the multiple choice exams were viewed by students as having significantly lower inclusive content and significantly lower utility value than either of the other two measures. So the turquoise bar is significantly lower than either of the other two bars, which don't differ from each other. 
So then we looked at performance on the three measures. And um, sadly, because of COVID-19, we didn't we weren't able to get time capsule data from last spring. So what we could compare was real world exam scores to multiple choice exam scores from last spring and time capsule scores to multiple choice scores from the year before. Um, but the takeaway here, and also because the class was um, nearly all underrepresented students, we didn't conduct analyses looking at how ethnicity and race influenced the scores. But the scores were significantly higher on the real world exam and time capsule than they were on the multiple choice tests. Okay, so I wish I was with you in person so I could answer any questions you had, but I'm gonna take the last 15 minutes to talk about how you might do this more broadly, because hopefully I've convinced you that it's something worth doing. Um, so the first thing that you wanna to do to create self-reflective assignments is identify what are the critical learning outcomes from your class. And you can do this by looking at the course catalog sometimes. Maybe you already have your learning outcomes. Maybe think about what is it that students really need to know in future classes, and maybe it's in your syllabus. When I was doing this for child development, I realized that my multiple choice tests were really focused on all these facts that students had to memorize. And, you know, with the internet, you can find any fact about child development pretty quickly without having it memorized. And what I really wanted them to know were some of the major concepts on good practice with young children and development. And so I moved away from all the testing that was factually based towards reflective assignments that was asking them to deeply consider some of these concepts. Then you wanna write a brief explanation of why each outcome is essential. And what you're doing here, you're gonna share this with the students, you may put it right at the beginning of the assignment, and you're explaining to the students the utility value. Why should this matter to them? How is it gonna help them professionally? How is it gonna help them personally? Or how is it gonna help them academically? And oftentimes you can come up with all three of those for an assignment. Um, next, you wanna create or adopt rubrics that will describe explicitly success on the assignment. And that's critical to make it inclusive because by really clearly articulating what it takes to succeed on an assignment and sharing it with students, you're making sure that everybody has an even playing field in terms of their awareness of what it takes to succeed. Um, and then finally, you're gonna create or adopt assessments to include self-reflection. Um, so here are just some sample guiding questions that might help you as you're trying to come up with this. You might ask students to describe their process as a learner. So when did you feel most engaged? Which information was mo most confusing or helpful? You want to help ask them maybe to evaluate the effects of learning. In what areas would you benefit from more study? And so, you know, it could be what area was most confusing and what do you think you could do to increase your understanding of it? Um, then, and this is, I think, probably the next two are the most important pieces, you ask them to integrate their learning with their life or with another class. You know, if you're talking about biology, it's sometimes, or chemistry, it may be harder to integrate with your life, um, but then it could be integrating it with something you learned in a previous semester. What would you want to tell a friend about this? Relate something you learned here to something you learned in the previous class. Use this concept to explain something in your life. Um, they did a great study at, or intervention at Madison, University of Wisconsin-Madison, where they asked students to relate biology concepts to their lives, and it led to a, a big um, decrease in equity gaps in the biology class. So it's been done in biology. Um, and then finally, you want them to either plan or envision a future self or prioritize. Um, so describe a way you'll change in the future based on this experience. What do you want to be sure to remember? Um, when you're creating your rubric, you want to make sure you list the criteria for the specific assignments. Describe varying levels of quality from excellent to poor. Or what I actually do is just describe excellent and then have scores that descend from full credit to partial credit. And as I mentioned before, provide a rubric. And so here I'm just going to show you one of my sample assignments. Um, this is 
the students had learned about good practice around dealing with trauma with children. Um, this was a lesson I actually would do on 9-11 each year. Um, and then they watched a video where children who had experienced trauma on 9-11 were now um, young adults and thinking back to their experiences. And a lot of them described ways that adults interacted with them that made the trauma worse. Um, so I asked students to summarize three principles that should be followed when helping children deal with trauma. And I would always say in your own words. So that's the comprehension. Um, then I asked, or the concepts, then I asked them to describe an experience from one of the children in the documentary that made it harder for the child to handle the traumatic experience. So they're applying what they learned, right? They had to take one of those concepts and explain how it explained something in the movie. Um, then use what you learned in lecture to explain why the experience wouldn't be helpful for a traumatized child. So that's further application. Propose a possible response from an adult that might be more helpful to the child using material from lecture to explain your answers. So that's analysis. And then remember what are the top three things you want to remember to help children cope with trauma. Now, you'll notice that in this example, the student is actually not self-reflecting, they're reflecting on another child. Um, and the reason I did that for this is, obviously you don't wanna be triggering students. Um, and so this particular content area, I felt I didn't wanna explicitly ask them to reflect on their own lives. And in child development, I would always give them the option of doing the assignment for a child they knew instead of themselves if they preferred. Um, but what I want you to notice is my rubric is the same pretty much as the rubric that you saw on the first slide. Um, it's just been modified to match this, but there's one element that matches each of those bullet points. Um, and so as the student's doing the assignment, they see the rubric and that they know, um, you know, they can sort of go and check off where they're going to get their points. And then this was a relatively early assignment. If they lost points for a change over time, um, I would give them specific feedback about the element that was missing. So that's how you get that performance approach behavior. Conclusions. So, um, you know, I'm a great believer in self-reflective writing. It increases equity. It supports students' academic self-act efficacy and it's easily adaptable to online instruction so you know we're all struggling right now as everything has gone remote and i know a lot of science faculty have been struggling about how to do labs and things like that um, and self-reflective writing you can actually ask students to you know watch a lab and reflect on their learning of it, or you can give them a rubric and ask them to describe their own learning. Um, and you know, they're imperfect, but that sort of self-reflective writing can actually be useful as we're struggling to find ways to assess things in an online environment. Um, and so yeah, I encourage you to, you know, consider using emergency remote instruction as an invitation to try self-reflective assignments if you haven't already. Um, I have my email there, so you know I really wish that we could have discussion and questions. Um, but if you send me an email, I promise I will write right back. Um, and as promised, these are a bunch of references that are different um, things I've published on this. So that first one um, is about a lot of the stuff I just talked to you about. Um, just looking to see the, the third one, Singer Freeman, Hobbs and Robinson, that is the whole model of culturally relevant assessment. Um, and then there's another one I want to, oh, Singer Freeman and Bastone 2017, that is some of the mindset research that I talked to you about today is in there. And then the one right under it, Singer Freeman and Bastone 2016. Um, has rubrics from all of my self-reflective writing assignments and describes in great detail the modifications that I made in that class. Um, so I think yeah, that's everything I wanted to tell you here. Thank you very much for coming and staying to the very end, and I wish you all the best. Good luck with doing self-reflective writing with your students.